Testing, testing. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello, Esther. Hello. You can hear me, great. So, hello everybody. Welcome to the College of Foreign Language and Literature and to um, our symposium, Manifestos for an International University. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, as uh, obviously most of you will be, uh, please be aware if you need a Korean translation for today's uh, intervention, then one is available in the chat box. So if you're watching on YouTube, on the right hand side, there will be uh, a link. You can click on the link and access today's uh, text in English. So, um, it gives me great pleasure today to uh, introduce you to our speaker, um, uh, Esther Leslie is Professor of Political Aesthetics in the Department of English, Theatre and Creative Writing and co-director of the Birkbeck Institute of the Humanities, Birkbeck University of London. She has written contributed to and edited dozens of books, among the most recent, in 2016, Liquid Crystals, The Art and Science of a Fluid Form, and in 2018, with Melanie Jackson, Deeper in the Pyramid. Esther is an intellectual biographer of Walter Benjamin and the translator, in English, of Walter Benjamin's archive. Elsewhere, she has written written widely on modernism and modernity, theatre, cinema and animation. She is a member of the editorial board of the journal Historical Materialism. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome her and uh, Esther, over to you. Thank you. This is called Poetic Manifesto. So given the stage to say what I like about education, about the possibility and desirability of an international university, I suddenly feel tongue-tied, requested to provide to individual a contribution on what must be a collective process. The manifesto form is collective, if it is not to be the fevered outpourings of a fascist. Where is my collective? Are you here listening or half listening? And education is a dialogue or it is nothing. But then I spend my days and none more so than the last 380 of them in my own head, in my own screen, on my own, with occasionally ghostly conversations on phone lines that threaten to swallow words or stretch them out into misrecognition at each moment. A British problem? poor bandwidth, a world problem, colluding with ghosts, those who had to make only the smallest of commitment to half concentrate on the pixel heads jitter jittering on their screens. So where have I thought together with another in the last while and worked together to conjure up some demands, some accords? I wrote a manifesto, alone, but with enough inflow of others' times and voices that I hoped it might propose some kind of collision, which is productive of energy. My manifesto is speculative, hyperbolic, as befits the format, and it wants to change word into deed, and yet, as befits the form, makes that only a future possibility, an unreasonable demand, because reason is the problem but is also the ground. And just as the first modernist manifesto, that of Marx and Engels, commences with ghosts haunting Europe, and just as I have been communing with other ghosts, 
with the dead people who have written many of the books I read, as well as pixel ghosts on Zoom channels that are the grave of being. This manifesto articulates the words of a dead person, though one not long gone, not smoothly, safely part of tradition yet. I thought some of these thoughts, or ones close to them, in the days after I heard he, Sean Bonney, had died, and that was in the weeks before a lockdown came in England. The situation proposed what had hitherto been unimaginable, in London at least, and in that regard had a certain poetic, ruptural quality about it. I will think through a ghost, a collectivised discussion with the dead, for he evokes more dead, more ghosts, endless gals, to imagine what it might mean to write a manifesto for a universal, for an international university. These thoughts are quickly composed. They seek to make an impression on the world, just an impression. I delivered, then, something akin to these lines on the picket line at University College, London, at the end of 2019. But there was strike, again, in the university sector. And the default mode of doing a strike now is to have classes on the picket line, teach-outs, we call them. And I had done one before, in 2014, with Sean Bonney and one other speaker in this series, Nina Power. Then, in 2014, I spoke of Walter Benjamin's passionate words about youth and experience and how experience is used as a stick with which to beat young people who lack it. I was called to the picket line again with Paul Gilroy and Matthew Beaumont to talk through an indistinct megaphone to a largely indifferent set of students who may or may not have crossed the picket line. Sean Bonney had just committed suicide in Berlin, aged 50. He was someone in whose orbit I had been and who was in my orbit for over 20 years. He was a poet. I began with an extract of one of his poems. Please don't cry. Time will come. Bear that in mind. Remember. Don't look at me. Don't cry. We are gathering the pieces. There will be no locked doors, no officials, no murders, no slaves. Sometimes we'll speak in colours, in musical notes. No passwords, no secret codes. But remember, serious, keep a pill in your mouth. Keep it there, these words there. Solitude, profit, humiliation, suicide. That's the dictionary of history. When they shoot it at us, fire back. I can't lie, things will get harder. But keep at it, despite our violence, our addictions, all this burning earth. I went on in 2019 to say something like this. Sean Bonney was an anarchist or an anarcho-communist, uncomfortable in some ways with trades union politics with which we are now engaged. He was more comfortable in the squatted occupations, such as the student occupation of 2010, which were a large and loud movement in opposition to spending cuts in education and increased student fees, and whose demonstrations felt the full force of the police baton on several occasions. Within this movement, he met a younger generation of political, aesthetical comrades who mourned his departure deeply. Those 2010 occupations were passionate, wild affairs, Places where the being different, being collective of all life was evoked. The students and their comrades protested against planned spending cuts to further education and an increase of the cap on tuition fees by the conservative Liberal Democrat coalition government. But they also germinated social centres, including those close to where the picket was, within sight across the square where Bonnie was just one of many who visited, spoke, agitated. To protest against the university, to argue specifically in 2010 as in 2014, 2018, 2019, for in all these years there was widespread agitation against the university as it exists, is to propose a new university or more to enact it. 
to set up through the processes of taking control of a situation provides the possibility of taking control of the whole situation and learning and unlearning together and extending learning and knowing beyond the disciplinary structures of the university. In 2010, in their occupation in Gordon Square in London, the students cultivated links to other university members, the cleaners for one. On 14th December 2011, Sean Bonney signed a letter to the management of another college of the University of London nearby, SOAS, who were proposing to evict the students from a building that had stood empty for many years, but was part of the SOAS estate. The Bloomsbury Social Centre represents a bright and necessary contrast to the market structures currently being imposed across UK higher education. It has been in existence now for three weeks. In that time, it has helped to organise toward the 30th November strike, organised tenants' rights workshops and coordinated with student occupations in Birmingham and Cambridge. It has hosted seminars and reading groups on the financial crisis, initiated Spanish classes to aid students campaigning alongside migrant workers, screened political cinema, housed temporarily homeless students, provided meeting space for fellow trade unionists and, in general, has tried to push forward the struggle for better conditions of life, both in this area and beyond it, both in the university and outside. It is unreasonable and unjust to proceed with an eviction against students who are struggling to improve the education and conditions of life for their peers and their neighbours. The students lost in 2010. They failed and were evicted from their occupation in a swift move. The building was repurposed as a graduate centre to enhance the marketability of SOAS and attract international postgraduates to its gleaming facilities in order to extract inflated international fees. But the occupations left their marks on those who went into them and came through them. After this movement of 2010, which must be seen as a defeat in objective terms for nothing changed in the universities, or rather, in fact, things got worse, Bonnie left London to become a research fellow in Berlin at the John F. Kennedy's Literature Department. That produced discomfort in some ways, though the stability of a salary must have been useful, gratifying. But it was a position he held with difficulty, for he did not identify with the institution, with the structures, with the role. He did not seek the comfort of success, which means being elevated above others. I wonder if in some way more of us feel that. I was drawn to Birkbeck long ago because there was some sort of semblance of peer-to-peer -peer association between lecturers and students, facilitated by the fact that ours were more often mature. I never felt that different to when I was a student, even as my wages grew. I could deceive myself that I was just a curious person amongst others. Now, though, hierarchies are reinforced in our universities with the blatantness of fees, with ranking tables, in our bloated universities of senior management teams who enjoy the ear of government, or worse, creep about with an ear trumpet directed at government, ready to carry out its every last wish. Where does that leave those of us who are here? Because we thought it was not the cliched ivory tower, but some sort of refuge from the hurts of the usual workaday world, a place that could be dedicated to the overcoming of that mean outside through subtle intellectual alchemy and the spread of arcane counter-knowledges, or, for some, the spread of rationality in the face of superstition. Only now we find it's just another place where a large chunk of your colleagues won't, can't, don't strike or actively oppose striking for pensions, for pay or conditions, for precarious working conditions and the exploitation of student labour. And what happens to us critics, we Bonnieites, when we become old enough to have to be management ourselves, to meet out the unfairnesses, to cut more from less and to spread the slack so that it accumulates slowly, like the gradually rising temperature of a pot of boiling water that kills and cooks a lobster. What responsibilities do we have and to who? And 
the only thing we might know is that there are ever more responsibilities and they usually undermine each other. And is it not the case that our escape routes reinforce the very problems against which in the face of which we strike? Precarity? What about that short-term researcher you built into your grant application? Complicity? Sean Bonney resisted, like any anarcho-communist, the thinking of the prosaic, boring, procedural, work-a-day, bore-a-day, of which top of the list must be pensions, which was the occasion for the last university strike before COVID-19 hit. Who wants to think from the end backwards? Not me. But it is another of the injustices we face that we are compelled to do so, to imagine our old, worn-out selves and to plan for them when that we, even though we will not all anyway get to see, or we will get to see it too soon and have been unprepared. It is, the, it is these days somewhat impossible for us or for many to think about ourselves liberated from labor, but there appears to be a receding chance of that now. But he was a strange ghost to conjure up. Sean Bonney was drawn to the origins of the avant-garde in revolutionary France, to the culture of the Paris Commune, the conspiracies of Baudelaire, the horror visions of Blanqui, the delirium of Rambo and Verlaine. Rather than striking the withdrawal of labor in the name of better pay and conditions, he might have been more attracted to Paul Lafargue's tract from the 1880s, Le Droit de la Paresse, the right to be lazy or the right to idleness. Lafargue was responding to and parodying the socialist demand for a right to work. To not do or do nothing, negation, not do it, a resistance. It's not laziness reevaluated as a positive trait or a resistant act, but a not doing, an undoing, or to undo doing. It proposed the demand to think the unthinkable, undo the doing, do the undoing, not wanting to work. Or go to work or to work. That year in 2019 when the strike came I was struck by the outpouring of misery of exhaustion of anger that coursed through social media. Lecturers testified to a hundred hour weeks to three hours sleep each night to vicious managers to abuse in the workplace to an impossibility to keep up to a future immiseration to a desire to leave or never begin in this field of employment once so desirable, even if always demanding something deep from the self. as a thing of passion, a confusion of self or job. Sometimes perhaps in these status updates, which like any status is paraded to outdo the others, I detected hyperbole. This is a poetic technique of exaggeration to produce strong effect. Sean Bonney's poetry was hyperbolic taking seriously that line in Adorno's Minima Moralia, knowledge comes to us through a network of prejudices, opinions, innovations, self-corrections, presuppositions, and exaggerations. In short, through the dense, firmly grounded, and by no means uniform and transparent medium of experience. And how far do we push it? We push it as far as we need to in order to glimpse something other only exaggerations are true in the field of knowledge of the self and revolutionizing the world. In defense of poetry, Percy Biss Shelley states that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. In being poetic, they we feel the world, absorb it and vomit it out again. And in picking through the causes of our sickness, we know it better than our daytime selves or management deep fake what self. Sean Bonney was wont to cite a line from Jean Genet in Letter to the American Intellectuals, a talk given at the University of Connecticut on 18th March 1970, first published as Bobby Seale, The Black Panthers and Us White People, in Black Panther magazine on the 28th of March 1970. It averred the proximity of poetry and revolution. As for the political thought of the Black Panthers, I am convinced it originates in the poetic thought of black Americans. We are realizing more and more that a poetic emotion lies at the origin of revolutionary thought. 
The words are good advice for turning the pain of being into a pain against being. The poetics of refusal. Genet's line then wanders into a territory that Borny cannot and does not enter. Genet writes, This is why we have to understand that it is on the basis of singular poetic emotions that Mao Tse Tung was led to revolutionary consciousness later on, to the Long March, then to the revolution called the Hundred Flowers Campaign, and finally to the Cultural Revolution. And it was the same for Ho Chi Minh. And the same is true for the Black Panther Party, which from the poetic resources of their oppressed people draws the will to elaborate a rigorous revolutionary thought. Genet succumbed, at least in rhetoric, to the Maoist illusion, and he could not extricate himself from his time, from the pressures of his time, from its movements flowing through him, from the thinking that is done for him and in him. Genet campaigned for anti-imperialism at home and abroad. He used the university system to appeal to white students to gain support for the Black Panthers. He used the fringes of that system, not the system itself, which is, for the most part, and usually and still, against knowledge, because it is for disciplinary specialisms and the rewarding of conventional thinking, of thinking within convention and for convention. Something different happens when learning takes place outside of this, not competitively but collectively, and in close accord with the grain of life and love. This is the poetry of which Genet speaks, emotions leading to consciousness. That he was consumed by what was happening on the world stage, the rise of Maoism in Europe, the partiality for Ho Chi Minh as an act of anti-imperialist commitment, cannot be subtracted from what it means to rethink the world as the world rethinks itself. And, in thought, will mingle much that is dead or wrong. The thought is living and breathing, and so can make mistakes. Is that process of meddling and meshing in the world a form of thinking for and in itself? Or is it something else, the world becoming conscious of itself, of how thought, theory, ideas steer, like a sail, the winds of history, the wounds of history? Thinking happens in a place, in a time. I read Lukács' Antinomies of Bourgeois Thought first when I was in an occupation at the University of Sussex in the 1980s. It was my homework reading for a class with Gillian Rose. To read it there in the occupied administrative building of the University of Sussex, with the pressures of that moment, that space, without the seminar room, while being simultaneously threatened with expulsion from the university and the invasion of the police, meant that it came to makes sense as a self-critical enactment of what praxis is. To illuminate, Lukács bemoans an ideal of knowledge as contemplation of formal connections, those laws which function in objective reality without the intervention of the subject. And Lukács goes on, the critical elucidation of contemplation puts more and more energy into its efforts to weed out mysteriously from its own outlook every subjective and irrational element and every anthropomorphic tendency. It strives with ever increasing vigor to drive a wedge between the subject of knowledge and man and to transform the knower into the pure, pure, purely formal subject. And herein lies the contradiction according to Lukács, and the contradiction is a generative one, for it is a contradiction that exists in the world as it is. That is to say, the contradiction that appears here between subjectivity and objectivity in modern rationalist formal systems, the entanglements and equivocations hidden in their concepts of subject and object, the conflict between their nature as systems created by us and their fatalistic necessity distant from and alien to man, is nothing but the logical and systematic formulation of the modern state of society. But on the one hand, men are constantly smashing, replacing and leaving behind them the natural and irrational and actually existing bonds, while on the other hand, they erect around themselves in the reality they have created and made, a kind of second nature which evolves with exactly the same inexorable necessity as was the case earlier on with 
the rational forces of nature, more exactly the social relations which appear in this form, to them, their own social action, says Marx, takes the form of the action of objects which prove and produce instead of being combined. Hi Esther. Hi yeah. Let's tr should we try to keep going so we can Yeah. We can uh, you you just got to the uh, the end of the the Lukash. Yeah. Okay. Let me pick up from there. Reification produces a contemplative stance vis-a-vis -vis the world. This can be cynical, pragmatic, practical, resigned in the face of an unalterable world of qualities with which, in which, we simply have to live. We have made everything. We made the university. It became our prison. Or it is antinomical to itself. Our contemplation leads to dreaming, to an ethical demand, to romantic thoughts and utopian ideals. A residual sense of being more than quantity, of being imaginative humans whose thoughts wander and persist. We can rethink this university. It can be a place of free exchange and passionate learning, but the contemplative stance remains on the level of thought, infused by world, but not infusing it. Rarefication cannot be overcome in thought, in or for itself, but thought in the form of philosophy as it grapples with the world and what it could be or ought to be casts a glimpse at freedom, even if it cannot attain it. Marxism comes to reflect and throw into crisis again that relation between thought and doing and when one thinks while doing and does while thinking something is refused. Perhaps the possibilities contained in a bourgeois philosophy of freedom have been stymied too often. Attention turns in an age of the self to the capacities of the broken self. What of our fragments, our partial glimpses, reflect a pool of possibility, the leap into freedom. Poetry becomes the conscious assertion of subjectivity as it registers both the pain of the world and its possible supersession, wound and word and world, maybe. Poetry is a whiff of the future that should be not the one we will likely get. Poetry is a bomb of words. Poetry is the barrel of a righteous gun. Poetry is not that thing you think it is, to do with flowers and the lyric I. It is a scarring in and of language that has registered hurt but still says no. It is a line delivered as a negation of the prosaic. It is a manifesto. It is a marking of the line that should not be crossed, as is the picket line. The picket line is a small stab at future thinking, at other being. Bonnie brings the picket line, small revolution, together with poetic form and with the cosmos or planetary, the space of collective dreaming, in his long poem, which is titled The Commons. This thing has 14 lines, as in picket lines, like Venus in a closing sky. This thing, this poem, like a picket line, is composed of a line and lines, and these lines will block meaning like they will block those who would too easily pass them or traverse them, and it will be redolent of love, or be just a vision of the sky on a clear day, and in that way a universal gesture. This thing is rarefied, it is a thing, it is only a thing, but it is also the absorbent pad of our pains and the thing that can stand as a bullock against everything going on just as it is. This thing is possibly beyond us and everything, but it also contains us. Bonnie also cites the French revolutionary Blanqui as a fold into a poem titled Lamentation in his collection All This Burning Earth, as well as on his blog a continuing ghost presence on the internet, abandoned buildings, monsters of the market. It is a stupid practice of our times to complain instead of acting. Jeremiah's are the fashion. Jeremiah is found in all attitudes. He cries, he lashes, he dogmatizes, he dictates, he rages, himself the scourge of all scourges. 
Let us leave the elegizing clowns, those grave diggers of liberty. The duty of a revolutionary is to always struggle, to struggle no matter what, to struggle to extinction. Louis Auguste Blanqui. So we struggle on. As we become extinct, we have one duty to go beyond denunciation into action on the world. Destructive, transformative, provocative, to go down fighting. Blanqui will end defeated one too many times. He is trapped in a prison of the world that is far worse than that of the Bastille, for it is illimitable and will be projected by him into the outer reaches of the cosmos, eternity by the stars. Yet he will continue to struggle, scream against the whole world and all that is wrong within it, whose wrongness only replicates more wrong, greater wrongness. We are forever outmaneuvered by what exists and oppresses us in ever new ways. Bonnet's poetic response to Blanqui locates what bears down on us, makes us despair and hope in a circular, repetitive motion. Laws to scratch your childhood, cells. Gods stashed below your bed, fairy tales, their blue love. And Bonnie comments poetically, but as an admonition or as a manifesto demand, remember it, to take these tales as advice, an organising vortex, each sentence stolen, each word a double claw. Act now. Words as claws double claws, redoubled claws, books as weapons purloined from the cannons that threaten to force them into conformism, all that. Traditions handed down as that which will destroy tradition, the broken fragments of wisdom to be recycled to finally make the passage from air to act. We do not know what new things we will be compelled to disagree with, but we know they will arrive and we will have our principles we set ourselves against instrumentalization, against utilitarianism, against knowledge as profit generation. We are for the universal rights and freedoms of thinking in and for itself, according to Jason Barker's call for papers. Are we? What is thinking in itself? Is this Aristotle's God, the prime mover, thought, thinking itself? And is not a manifesto demand different to make thinking not in itself or for itself, but for us or for an other? The socialization of our thinking, the collectivization of our thinking, thinking the university universally, which might mean to unthink it and to both smash, replace and leave behind the natural, irrational and actually existing bonds of the academy in a move towards freedom while tying ourselves up in new institutions that can only tend towards the ossification of thinking, if it is not in constant argument with itself, recovering poetic reserves of injustice and intuition within itself, slipping and sliding to not allow that which we have made but has become objective rule over us, to escape our time, our place, our language, while being so thoroughly trapped by it, pushing outwards, sucking in, being a collective subject on the point of discovering its potential agency, countering mood with wish, smashing language and sense into poetry, rejecting poetry in favour of riot, insisting on the identity of those two things, however absurdly, and setting language and action wildly into the world in whatever way we can is all I can come up with, except for one last manifesto gesture. Blast the international university that sucks up international fees. Bless the university that has unraveled itself and ground its business wing to dust and has no wall between it and the street. Blast the academic Marxist who carefully weighs up the ballast of the conjuncture in order to publish another paywalled article. Bless the messy thinking that cares not for fashion or prestige or journal rankings. Blast boring open access research that just prolongs with heavy moralism the persistence of dull texts of academic hair splitters. Bless posters, memes, 
small press bits and pieces, stolen manuscripts, recycling, Twitter spats that get the blood up, sleep, learning from chance encounters, unexpected good chats, overturning hierarchies, and remaining silent at the right times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, do we have any questions or responses to Esther's uh, intervention and to Sean Bonney, this strange ghost? Yeah, absolutely. I think you need to come here, though. Yeah, if be careful when you come up. There's no wires or anything. <laughs> I don't want you to go flying. You could just try and keep it as close as possible to you. Okay. Thank you, Professor uh, Le Le Leslie, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I am a fan of yours because I also wrote a paper on Benjamin. So. Uh, I'm honored to have a talk for a short talk. <laughs> I never knew about Sean, you know, the poet, but I f have a similar situation that he would have in confrontation with the strikes, doesn't go well, and how he would have dep been depressed. Because a few weeks ago, not, not a week ago, you know, the Japan, uh, they uh, emit the contaminated water to the, you know, sea, and the young girl students, college students, they strike in the rain, and they were pushed by the new city mayor, who is kind of a uh, orthodox and conservative, and they want to allow the to hide their, you know, themselves from the rain and. And all the professors, radical professors, were anxious. I am one of them. And I was really devastated not to have a chance to help them. And also, so I really feel what the poet must have felt. So uh, even though it's a sad death, I really want to share this thought with you. His death is an indicator showing how hard we have to overcome conformism, conformism as your uh, inter, you know, translated work says. We have to overcome this great war of barrier uh, prohibiting our welfare, our way of freedom. And uh, I really want to uh, give this thought to you that I was really sad myself. And I felt there was somebody who also had the same feeling. And through his, this event and through your talk, I kind of, you know, ready to encourage in whatever I can to go forward for our mm -hmm. freedom and for our march against uh, this capitalistic society, which ruins not only the great poet, but also the great nature, Mother Earth, which uh, contaminates the water of the sea of Korea, Donghae, East Sea, uh, by, because of the capitalistic you know, pursuit of their own uh, mo mon monetary funds or whatever. So mm -hmm. I do not have a specific question. What I want to share this occasion is that I have really same feeling for the poet and I want to find ways to do whatever he wants us to do for the remaining life of my academic life which is going to be shortened anyway uh, I just want to share my thought with you by this occasion. Thank you for wonderful lecture. You, in, oh. you know, enkindled my kind of thought for desire for work, for the humanity, mm -hmm. especially for mm -hmm. nature. So if you mm -hmm. have some thought about nature, 
considering this Korean uh, contamination, uh, you know, caused by the nuclear war, I mean, nuclear plant of Japan, if you have some kind of thought connected with your uh, desire for strike and also uh, the desire for our strike against this contamination mm -hmm. by the capitalism, against this mm -hmm. pure nature, uh, the only atmosphere that we can live in, okay? Sorry, too long. <laughs> Baba. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was, that was fantastic to hear. Thank you so much for that. And, and I'm really um, happy that you, uh, that in, in a sense, even though there's much tragedy and talk of defeat and, and pain, it is that which continues uh, to make us fight against it. You know, the, the, in a sense, we can't give up because we've lost too much already and and that shouldn't be a a depressing thought it's it's something about the expansiveness of what there is to reclaim and to to take back which includes nature which um is is being devastated be you know beyond our control and it's um I think that's the thing, that's what I take in away from Lukács, but I, I see it in Benjamin and I see it in Bonnie and or in any wonderful revolutionary thinker is thinking the entirety of things. And what I find interesting in Lukács is the way that he helps us to, to think about the, the ways in which nature is always becoming instrumentalized and turned into uh, just a, a resource for uh, accumulation but it, it's hard to perceive that because it just becomes part of everyday life you know it's just the the world around us that we abuse these resources and we use them all up and I think there are fantastic people like you say your, your students who are protesting against this who are just seeing things differently or allowing themselves to to feel the the importance of of saying no of resisting it even though it exposes them and many people will be exposed and it is brutal but there there seems no other way i guess but thank you for your comments thank you yeah um any other questions i'm just looking on our our chat box is empty at the moment so Anyone online would like to pose a question at this point? Um, I, t I, I mean, I could, I could just say something. I think um, hyperbole, yeah, with, with Bonnie, I think, um, absolutely. And, of course, with the manifesto in, in general, right? I mean, it doesn't really work without that, um, that sense of exaggeration. And, and, and I think that came across really well in your talk. Um, but it strikes me, those three poets actually, I mean, you briefly mentioned uh, Rambo, uh, but Genet and, and Bonnie, it strikes me that they are also, uh, each, each in their own way, um, poets of a failed revolution, right? You know, Rambo mm -hmm. with the Commune, um, Genet with 68, he kind of came a bit late to 68, I think, actually, you know, right? I'm not sure um, mm. what, what he was up to, but he kind of got the tail end of, end of it, I think, with, uh, with 68. And, of course, with Bonnie, um, uh, not necessarily a failed revolution, but a failed student revolt, right? The 2010 mm. student riots, which, which um, um, had such a, obviously had such a kind of profound effect on him. Um, as a writer um, and as a poet, um, so I'm wondering if there's if there's that, and if maybe he's more he's more kind of problematic as all of those three are, I think, problematic as revolutionary poets because they've all got this same. I mean, okay, to different extents and in different ways, different types of language, um, different styles. But they've all got this kind of impatience and petulance, haven't they, don't you think? I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of 
also evident when you watch Bonnie. I mean, I never saw him live, but I've seen clips of him um, performing. And it's, there's a kind of quiet, um, there's an incredible energy and, uh, you know, manic energy that he has when he's delivering. I mean, not all the time, but often. Um, but I wonder if that kind of leads to this kind of um, despair as well, you know? There's a kind of despairing nature. I mean, and again, in each in their different ways, you know, Rambo and Genet, I think, also had it. I mean, Rambo des definitely has it by, like, you know, what is the final poet in Saison uh, Enfer? It's like uh, Farewell, I think, right? You've got this kind of... You know, it's a kind of desperation and a despair. And although it's, it's quite sublime in, um, you know, this kind of sublime abject or abject sublime that you've got in, in Rambo, I'm not sure that Bonnie's got that. Um, but there's certainly a, a kind of despairing um, desperation in it. It's almost like, you know, he's kind of losing the discipline of what it would be um, or what it would mean to find the poetic form that he's searching for. Do you know what I mean? Does that, I mean, I think it came across really well in that first poem. Could you, maybe we could put that on the screen. Uh, Sungjae, could you put number one up on the screen? The uh, poems after Katerina um, uh, Gogol, yeah? That one, where it's kind of... Um, so that first one, yeah... Um, Sometimes we'll speak in colours, in musical notes, no passwords, no secret codes, but remember, serious, keep a pill in your mouth. Keep it there. These words there, solitude, profit, humiliation, suicide, that's the dictionary of history. So that's, you know, there's a, there's a real kind of, you feel for, you know, you feel for the, for the writer of those lines. Um, but I don't know what you think. I mean, it's kind of... So there is that, yeah, the resistance and struggling to the very end. But I'm just wondering if the exaggeration kind of sort of topples over into this real sense of despair and desperation. I don't know. Yeah, and I, I see what you're saying. And also a kind of romanticism of despair. And I think that's something I'm sort of suggesting, although I think it's difficult to say and what do I know but you know the almost the need for um, the despair and the negativity in order to produce the anger to produce poetry so at any moment in which something is built up then the the kind of poetic energy is dissipated and it falls away so there's um, you know, it, it, it becomes impossible to to find a a more comfortable place for yourself because that will be the end of your, your sense of self. Um you know, and and that is fatalistic and that's not a strategy for for others to to bring something together or make something happen. It's funny though, as I was reading that that piece that you just quoted, what it reminds me of more than anything in in terms of its it, it, its feel is um uh brecht's 1920s poems which are all about advice for a, a city dweller um which then benjamin sort of reads them analyzes them 10 years later and kind of sees all sorts of clues in a way to to what is to come in terms of um fascism and how the city will be under fascism so you know Brecht is sort of doing this classic alienated city dweller thing you know talk to no one don't leave it, any traces efface the traces otherwise someone will find you and it has that sort of feeling to me of this um which you know Brecht was was writing those at the point when he's a kind of s cynical man who's hasn't really um embraced the, the sort of mar marxism of the 30s and a, a kind of constructive um poetic practice he's still in that that sort of earlier post-expressionist kind of uh, phase of the city is 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 a is a nightmare and it's full of um violence and horror um and he's articulating that but then benjamin can see the ways in which that sensing 
a, a far greater state sanctioned uh, violence to come that's sort of on his radar in the in the way that um, poetry might be if it's sensing these first winds of things and of course Benjamin doesn't necessarily always see poetry doing that he sees fashion doing that as well maybe in um, other ways so I, I guess it's I see what you're saying about the the despair I think it's part of a kind of anti-tradition as well though I think it's significant as you said you know Baudelaire is a, a poet of of defeat especially like the defeat of the Paris Commune um, uh, yeah, so Rambo is poet is of defeat Genet um, uh, and, and the end of 68 and so on the he, he's bringing in all of this ghostly tradition of loss but then again I think also like Benjamin it's according to a theory that we don't revolt in the name of our grandchildren the ancestors to come but in in the name of all the horrors that have been committed um, yeah on those who came before us I suppose and I think it's got that sort of sense of we're, we're not just responding to the horror of now but to this accumulation of horrors and that's why it becomes so weighty so so huge a task and in a sense so impossible a task yeah absolutely no i mean um i think he's better i think he's better than Genet at, uh, um, at expressing you know that Actually, I don't. I don't think. I mean, Genet obviously. I mean, is some poetry, but um, in the extract that you quoted from uh, from Genet, I mean, it's all. It's almost. I mean, with respect, it's almost a joke, actually, right? The kind of you know, the hundred flowers and the Cultural Revolution. I mean, typical. For, yeah. You know, typical of many French intellectuals at that time. They didn't know anything about it. I mean, they just had no yeah. no clue, right? I mean, it was. Yeah. It was sloganeering in this in the in the sense that precisely bonnie hates right you know bonnie is yeah. certainly against any of any kind anything which even the whiff of agitprop or you know sloganeering mm -hmm. and i know that was yeah and, and maybe that's part of his frustration right that, that that's also coming out in the in the poems too this total frustration at not being able to to pinpoint you know or to or to you know or to, or to seize on um, the revolutionary moment, you know, with his, with his, with all the kind of impetus and force that's required. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah, yeah, and I, I think he only cites that because he, he cites the first part, which is really to pass the mantle to Amiri Baraka as an actual revolutionary black poet, um, I guess. So in a sense, Genet is just a, a, a conduit to to something to, to something, someone else, and to a more authentic man manifestation of the um, poetic thought of black Americans as a revolutionary act. But it, it produces, I guess, a, a link to a certain kind of European avant-garde tradition um, that's attracted again and again to revolution, but yeah, often um, collapses at the last moment or, you know, sidesteps uh, into somewhere else. Yeah, but I mean, he certainly had the kind of the logical revolt. So, I mean, in that sense, you know, he did, he, he kept going and um, uh, we can admire him uh, uh, greatly for that. Yeah. Um, any final questions? A oh, question on YouTube? Okay, so Pelagia is saying, hello, thank you for the great intervention, ideas, ways of writing poetry together uh, in a sense of community. Uh, in, what, in what ways is poetry a collective form, uh, she's saying. Uh, also on how poetic language includes instead of excludes. So sense of in what ways is poetry a collective mm. form, Esther? Yeah, I, think, I mean, because of, of course people you know, it, in the end, often the poet is just writing alone. 
um, and it's not necessarily a collective form. But I think one of the things that struck me over, you know, certainly the past few years, I think with within the UK partly, but elsewhere, is how poets or radical and revolutionary poets are gravitated together um, and, you know, produced um, work together or um, uh, events, you know, that it, it's, we're not talking about, you know, a Seamus Heaney or well, who are the contemporary ones, a Simon Armitage, you know, sort of elevated and, and, and prized for their particular kind of poetic insight in, into the world. This is this is a collective practice with a lot of exchange, but also in terms of a writing practice, it's it's often to do with absorbing different uh, languages and registers uh, within the world or writing in a sense on the cusp of consciousness. So what's flowing through you is, is already sort of socialized thought because it's stimulus from the environment or from the media or you know other places so you it's collective in the sense that you give yourself over to language as a, a different type type of um, expression that's not held on to as your own personal lyrical expression so I think that's that can be part of it which is why in some ways it 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 is often not transparent to understand, which then in some ways, some might argue, is exclusive because it becomes a puzzle or confusing. But I, I think the register at which it works is is in some way emotional or it's it's there to trigger things not from within rationality but in some other way within the self to sort of activate you as a thinker, as a writer, as a user of language and as a dreamer, I suppose. Yes, that kind of encounter with the other or the infinite outside, right? It kind of has to be a, like an encounter of some kind, I suppose. Um, yeah, and you have to be sort of changed in it or activated through it in in some way but but not confirmed mm. um destabilized maybe or opened up or mm. cut off or something has to happen mm. yes any final questions i'll say final questions we've only been going for an hour and five an hour and five minutes i can't <laughs> is, that, is that right i can't i can't quite believe it um Final comments or questions? No? Okay. Uh, okay, so we've managed to kind of ward off the gremlins, uh, Esther, just about, I think. We had that slight, just about. slight hiccup in the middle, but um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really great, actually. It was, it was really, really stimulating. Uh, um, and Bonnie, yeah, um, uh, we still have so much, actually. I mean, he's, uh, I'm sure we're going to keep talking about him. And, mm. um, yeah, his kind of militancy, right? His uh, poetic militancy. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, thanks ever so much uh, for joining us. Um, uh, I hope maybe one of these days, you know, when all of this goes back to some kind of new normal, you might be able to join us over here I know it's um, I would love to yeah it's something <laughs> something we've we've spoken about in the past but um, yeah maybe that will maybe that will happen in the not too distant future so um, yeah That's thanks ever so much Esther thanks Great. thank you thanks, thanks a lot. everyone thanks. see you see you bye, bye.